It is just a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Sean Carlson at the Henry Schein Ortho Summit. Sean, I, um, you can watch all my podcasts. I've never said this, but you've been the number one most requested orthodontist again on. I get emailed all the time. I've been chasing you for two years. I don't believe you for a second. Two Howard. years. I don't I believe you. I'm either in your spam filter. <laughs> um, go back. But um, this is Henry Schein pulled out all stops. They, could, they they brought speakers in here from Barcelona, Spain. Yeah. This is the, the biggest whales in ortho. So congratulations for well, being. Thank you. Appreciate uh, and, and you are you are probably the biggest whale in ortho that I know of from everything. So I, sweet, but it is true. <laughs> so sweet. So my, my question is, I, and I want you know, I uh, so jealous of your your hair. I mean, I'm just uh, I don't know what I'm more jealous of your hair, or your six pack. So you know, I'm I'm feeling very uh, very bad. Day. I hope you're watching us on iTunes. If you're seeing this on YouTube, I look ten I, times fatter and balder today than any other day. I was blessed with good genes. Good genes. Yeah. My doctor said the only good genes I ever got was a pair of Levi's. Um, but what were that you? Works. What were you speaking on? What, what's got you? So what's got you today passionate? specifically. So this this was uh, today. I wanted to go more future. I wanted to kind of talk to people about you know applying all the stuff that they're learning at the at the com at the conference to where their practice is going in the next 10, 20 years. So. What I did is use the 3D stuff, the cone beam stuff that we've been using. You know, my practice, we've been using it since 2008. My partner in crime, Dr. Quintero, we've been teaching cone beam courses for a while. But I wanted to put something together for this lecture that kind of looked a little bit broader at the specialty. Like, where's orthodontics going? I mean, I think this meeting is, is I mean, the energy is crazy because everybody's kind of looking not at what they're doing now, but what's inevitably coming. And that's pretty exciting. I want to just map that out a little bit. And what, what is coming? Where, where, 3D where is, going? is here. So the, the biggest thing, I think, everything that's volumetric, whether it be a surface map scan, intraoral scan, cone beam CT, diagnostics, treatment planning, uh, treatment execution, so computer-aided treatment, all those things are... I mean, the technology is here now that we can do it, but it's how we're all going to be practicing. It's just, it's just happening. So all the 2D dentistry and orthodontics that's been done for the last hundred years, we're seeing an end to that right now. And it's pretty, it's pretty dramatic. What would you say to an orthodontist listening and saying, I'm fine with my pano and stuff. I don't need to go 3D. It's, it's a lot it's, of money. What would you say to that guy? It's a ton of money. And, and it, it's, <laughs> but it's not a as ton of alimony. It's, 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 it's so a I've lot heard. cheaper than a divorce. So I've heard. Um, the, the, the biggest thing is it's, it's cost prohibitive. So a lot of people have trouble getting in because it's expensive. Learning curve is high. And it's it just a lot of people are hesitant from the dose thing was a big argument for a while ago, a while ago. Those three are the kind of the biggest excuses I've heard from not going in. Cost, learning curve. Cost, learning curve, dose. Those are the biggest risks. My, my, my question would be, what is, what percent is the regret factor? The, what, tell me. Buyer's remorse. Zero. I, across the board, zero. If I talk to any orthodontist that has it that made the jump and you ask them if they could go back to practicing in 2d i haven't come across one that would choose to do that so for me it's a question i get all the time i'm doing my 2d so is why why do i need it's to like do I this i never met anyone who said i would um, give up my eyesight to play like stevie wonder on the piano yeah i, I mean, no no one yeah. wants to see less right no you just can't you can't go back so for the orthodontist that's practicing in the 2D world, they're fine. They're not, they're, they're not doing crappy work. It's just they're doing what they're used to. And that, I think, is where the challenge in ortho is because we've been tremendously successful and we've done it really well up until now and everything has worked, so it's why change. And I don't think people are feeling the hurt as much yet. And that's where I think 3D is going to really start to transform the profession. Um, because if you talk to someone like myself or, or JC Quintero about mistakes they used to make, we used to make 10 years ago, we just, we don't make those because we're seeing things differently. And, and that, that's the power of this. You just start to look at things completely differently. I can't diagnose personally off a of pan and a set of models anymore. I, I don't have enough information. 
I'm guessing at way too much. So I know what they're yelling in the car. What brand? There's so many to go to. They go to a convention. There's so many models. I mean, how many different brackets and CVCTs are at a convention these days? You, you, um, brackets? And oh, I, I mean, there's, there's dozens of companies that make brackets and there's I think at least a dozen, probably more CBCT manufacturers. So make it easy for them. Which one would you recommend? Well, currently I own an iCat Flex and that's on purpose. And I own an iCat Flex because I believe it's the best machine right now, period. My philosophy with equipment, and that goes for brackets, that goes for wires, goes for intraoral scanners, cone beams. As soon as there's a better one made, I'm going to go to it. So I don't, I don't have a lot of company loyalty. I know that sounds sacrilegious in the, in the, in the field, but I just go where stuff's good. Well, you so did I don't it. care. Well, we all did it with our cell phones. I mean, remember we thought Motorola right. was the greatest right. thing ever. Right. Then it was Nokia. Right. And now it's iPhone. Of course. So everyone, yeah. everyone's going to do what's as best. As soon as somebody makes a better product, I'm going to use it. I just want to do so, the so best it stuff. Seems like, it seems like iCat, I mean, so many people... So many of the legends use iCat. Why do, you, why, do you, why do you think that is? I think it's, it's just they were one of the first to the game. First so they, they actually had a lot of learning mistakes under their belt before it got a little bit more widespread. Um, they're on their third or fourth generation machine. Um, it's a really, it's a well-built workhorse. It's, it's I, I liken it to, I've had two iCats so far, and, and it's like... A, it's just like a, a really well built truck. It just, it, it just I really works. messed that. Uh, I bought the iDog. dog. <laughs> What's and, the uh, dog? You know, uh, I should have bought the iCat. I should have known better. <laughs> uh, especially since I have three cats. Okay. Um, but anyway, I have um, two cats. Do you have two? I do. Two cats and a dog. <laughs> two cats and a dog. Yeah. Um, so, are you still taking alginate impressions, or are you scanning? So we just got our intraoral scanner. It's, it's brand new. So we're, we've been in the 3D world for a long time, but intraoral scanning has just been late to the, the office just for no other reason than, you know, we just got on board late. We were just waiting for technology to be to that place where you could scan really quickly. And, and I think we found that with the, with the three-shape th three trios, which is why we decided to get in there. Okay, three-shape... Um, that's um, Copenhagen, Denmark? A Denmark company. Correct. That's the one you went with? Three Shape out of uh, Copenhagen? Yep. And another one would have been uh, 3M, and Minneapolis has one. Um, yeah, what is, what is there? Is 3M's the... Trios? No, is no. Is it the Itero or something? The, is it the I, I don't I don't remember. I just know uh, there's the Itero. There's a... Uh, oh, my gosh. There's another one. Um, there's a handful on the market. I mean, I think they're so all... So why did you go with Three Shape? A couple reasons. Um, I had the opportunity to meet some of the people at Three Shape. I'm a big people person, Howard. I'm all about people, more than product, more than company, more than team, whatever. True definition more than price. scanner. Sorry. Three M was a true definition scanner. Oh, I don't know. According to Google. Okay. Three M control scanners. Okay. I don't know who makes the. Well, I don't know who makes them all, but okay. but anyway, it's it's um. I, I just learned a little bit about their their development team and some of the people involved, and um, and you can actually you, this stuff is all readily available. There's so much video content out there that you can actually you can dig pretty deep into these companies just by going to YouTube, and so many companies have actually put out just just like mini little snippets of their you know of their team, just like talking about stuff and motivation and what they're on about and. Um, uh, Three shape initially was was really becoming attractive because of the they 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 were really focused on design and simplicity and I'm a really big design guy I like design super simple super elegant don't give me a bunch of bells and whistles think it through tell me the one button I need and don't give me five don't you make sound me like click. Steve Jobs <laughs> of course don't uh, that it's so great how the Apple design team thought about developing these products because it, it's they thought through a lot about what the user actually needs before they actually made the product it's not this let's just put everything on there and see what they use they say well, okay let's step back what do you really need a scanner for what do you what do you really want it to do what do you really want your phone to do and let's take up all the take away all the stuff that's going to get in your way and just get you right to that spot 
And that's the kind of stuff I like. So, um, and what, I, did, what did you want it for? You just tired of alginate and mixing in a bowl? No, no. It, it's more that I think the, the the data that it acquires is extremely powerful because it, it lives in that in that static digital space. It's always there. So, when you take a three D scan surface map of, of the teeth and lock it into occlusion, you have that record forever. You can merge it with a cone beam scan, which is extremely powerful, but you can do a lot with that record. I can't do that with a model. I mean, maybe I can do a little wax up setup on the model, some little modifications of the teeth, but I've already gone through multiple steps of error creation by the time I get to the study model. There's error in taking an alginate, there's error in how the alginate sets. There's error in pour up of the stone. There's error in aging of the stone. There's error in measuring and making an appliance to the stone. If I just have a digital model that you're gives making me, me stone, just saying all these all these errors. <laughs> it's true. There's yeah. so much there, and the more we can eliminate, which is why I love three D data, is it actually pulls the um, can I cuss on this podcast? It pulls the bullshit out of ortho. I mean, there's so much bullshit in our records, so many things we've just kind of accepted as okay, and they're really just lies in data. 2D images of a three-dimensional head, it's a fabrication. It's not really what's there. And so when you start scanning and you start doing three-dimensional voxel rendering, you're getting at the truth, and we've never had that in the 100 years of ortho. That's why I love I'm it. I'm still surprised at how many orthodontists offs I go into, and they're still using charts. You mean not a computer? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Charts. I, if there are people doing that, I am surprised. No, no, there, there. I, I still see it a lot. Like a, a physical, a card. physical chart. Right. They're not scheduling by a book, though. Right? No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that is similar to the entry into 3D, and that's just a, that's just a knowledge hurdle. It's just the charts work right? And they've been doing it for however many years they've owned their practice. And it's like, okay, how do we go digital? Oh, we have to enter all this stuff. And, and then we have to, do we scan the car? What are we going to do in that interim? And that hurdle is just too hard. If you could turn their practice into digital tomorrow and make it easy for them, they'd be all in. But I think the only reason they don't do it is because what they're doing is, is working. It's, it's, it's enough. It's okay. So um, they walk into an orthodontic convention. You said there's a dozen companies making more than one line of brackets. Um, how do you how do you make sense of that? What the, I know because I know what they ask. They they always tell me like, well, what was he using? You know, um, what what? So they're gonna want to know what bracket are you using and why? So I'm I'm pretty old school with my ortho. To be very honest, I actually have I use a mini twin. Um, I currently use um, a custom prescription. I use a, a GAC microarch, and because GAC, we GAC is that Ormco? It, no, GAC is GAC. GAC is that who yeah. owns GAC? Is that Densply? Oh, uh, maybe. Is it Densply? Yeah, I think so. Okay, G I don't, GAC. I don't know the hierarchy of that. Okay, that's um, And the reason being, we've you know we developed a custom prescription with them. We're an 018 slot, so that means we're a smaller wire. Um, the bracket is super small, and it's really well refined in terms of just how it, the, the way it's designed. And it's worked extremely well. And so that's a place where, again, we're not, we're not trying to fix what's not broken. And so we, we like how that works, but we're stretching into different territory. Like we're, um, you know, something like... Uh, um, just, just new approaches to ortho, like this meeting, the Henry Schein meeting, um, you know, like the motion appliance where some the people use it, they're all the in carrier the motion. carrier motion. Some people are all in with it and we're, we're playing because I'm seeing some things from other guys. That's like, wow, that's pretty amazing. All right. How's that going to work in my hands? So I'm a big believer that just using the bracket that the other guy uses it's it's a terrible way to pick your bracket. So you said you use the the uh, the um, microarch. I use GAC microarch. Microarch. Yeah. I thought you said mini twin. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, okay, this Mi is microarch. It's uh, it 
Okay. I think I think that's what it is. Anyway. <laughs> well, here, here, here's their here's their brackets. Which one we're using? No, not even here, right? So we're we're um. Yeah. So we're 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 like way down, like even below like the, <laughs> the fancy stuff, right? Where I use this guy. It's the micro arch. Yeah. So you use the micro arch. So yeah. so just curious, why not a self ligating bracket? Um, we played with it. I, I played with all the self lighting brackets from the Damon to the ovations. I mean, uh, a lot of stuff came out and I started practice in the late nineties and, um, you know, played around with, with a lot of stuff up till 2005, maybe, um, the way I exercised my mechanics, it, I, I didn't get big advantage. Um, and I like small, I like really small packages and so i like a bracket that's really small on the tooth and uh, as an aside i think brackets will not be here in the future to be honest with you so you think brackets won't be here in the no, future absolutely not and what's it going to be replaced with computer technology and though there will be some way to grab hold of a tooth with the force you need that does not have to be a bracket like an and invisalign tray I, not even Invisalign tray. I mean, I think there's going to be other ways to move teeth that aren't just a tray. I mean, trays are getting pretty advanced in what they can do, but there's still certain movements where there's some challenges. And, and I think there's some efficiency steps that it still can't capture because you need a true grip on the tooth over and above an attachment. But I think the way we're developing computer-assisted orthodontics, if you have some force component, and that can be delivered by a super elastic wire. Uh, there's a million ways to deliver a force component. Being able to n reverse engineer from where the teeth should be back to where the teeth are and design those force levels with something that's not a bracket, that's easy to change, that's the future. I don't, I don't think you sound like brackets Wayne Gretzky. Are, sorry? You sound like Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> Uh, what, do you, what do you say? Skate to where the puck should be, or right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, totally. Yeah. And and I and I think you have to think that way in, in in orthodontics. You almost have to imagine your practice. Yeah, skate to where the puck's going to be, not to where it is. And that it gi it gives you a different mindset. I think you start thinking about orthodontics differently. And, and I, everything that I've learned about computer technology and the way technology is advanced, I didn't think we'd be here in my lifetime, Howard. I didn't think I'd have a 3D virtual patient on a computer. Are you kidding me? I, I didn't think that was gonna happen. And to see how far we've come in the last 10 years and imagine what the next 10 is gonna bring, yeah, you better see, start I thinking past Kansas, brackets. And in Kansas, you know, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, everybody in Kansas said, you know, it always happens first on the coast. Yes. And you're right up there on the uh, north of uh, San Francisco. Right in the Silicon Valley yeah. region, yes. So you're, you're, you're in the high-tech capital. We're world. tapped so in. So everything you're talking right. about won't be to, in Oklahoma for Another 10, 20. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't actually think, I don't think it's going to be that slow anymore. I yeah. really believe in, in this space, like this digital, the fact you can talk to 100,000 people, that's crazy. Like that, the fact that somebody in Kansas or Oklahoma or wherever can learn what I'm doing in California through a digital space, no, they're not going to be that far behind anymore. It's too quick. Oh my God, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg's dad is a dentist. Yeah. And he was uh, telling me this morning, we, had, we did a podcast at our house this morning, and he was saying that 80% uh, of American adults have a Facebook account, and 60% of American adults check it every day. Yeah, so for they, sure. The, the speed of yeah. information oh, yeah. is just crazy. The, the connection to me is what's most exciting. I mean, it's a, a lot of people, including me, blew off digital space for a long time. I mean, I'm, you know, I was born in the late 60s, so. So you're a hippie. So I'm a hippie. hippie from California. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, when digital came around, even like the smartphone, um, I wasn't a first to Facebook. I was like, when it came around, I was like, no way. No, I'm not going on there. And I remember I went, shortly after it came out, I got an account and, and, I, and I went on there and I was completely underwhelmed and unimpressed. And I just closed my account within like three months. I'm like, I don't want to be here. This is just ah, too much stuff coming at me. It's nonsense. And it was probably only, you know, a couple of years ago that I even stepped into the digital pond and said, well, let's just see what people are doing professionally because I'm just interested. All right, what's happening in orthodontics? And, um, and, and I put my toe in and just 
psh, all the way in. Because I realized what you're experiencing is, yeah, you, you can affect the world in this teeny little spot like, like this. We're in this little room in, in Scottsdale and, yeah, somebody in China. I'm, I'm going to throw you a loop ball of a question. All right. I'm going to hit you from behind the head. So you're talking about all this futuristic stuff. What's not going to change in ortho? Patient care. This is the, and this is crucial, and it's crucial to our profession, and I think we're kind of missing it. Health care, which is what we do, I believe, what we do, and, um, you know, what JC and I lectured about yesterday was this whole health orthodontics, airway, you know, dental velar health, you know, a lot of things. Health care is not scalable. Treating a patient, you cannot scale that. I don't care how many computers well you have. Well you said. cannot scale it. You have to still do that. And that relationship, that doctor-patient, I'm treating you and you're an individual, will never disappear. No matter how good we get at the stuff, you can't scale that. And that I think we forget. And, and in orthodontics, where there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk of volume. You know, it's like, oh, let's... let's you know, make it easy. Let's bring in computers to do stuff that we don't need to do. The human component is, is it's really important. People are still coming to you for healthcare. It's not just, oh, just. I think that the most um, profound thing happened in your space, Ortho. Um, Orthodontic Centers of America was the first DSO. I remember. Rolled them all up, made it, the only one that made it to the New York Stock Exchange, billion dollar evaluation, and a spectacular Crumb. implosion. Yes. And people forgot that lesson. I know. And now they're back. There's yes. 35 chain. Not Wall Street is the only one that didn't forget. Wall Street wouldn't touch a dental DSO if you put a gun to their head. Right. And, I get it. And and the, Wall Street knows dentistry is not scalable. Wall Street knows orthodontics. The only people who don't believe that dentistry is not scalable are all these scared dentists who think we're yes. all going to be working at McDentals. Yes. I and it's that. just not gonna I know happen. That. Yeah, it's it's it is a fear thing. It's a fear-driven concept, and it's it's it, trying to get to the younger the younger generation. Like my generation, when I came out and bought my practice, I was in competition to buy my practice with Orthodontic Centers of America, and they were gonna offer more, <laughs> yeah. and and they were going all around saying, "No, we'll give you more." And, and there was a little, there was enough, um, I, I don't want to say integrity because it's not just that, but there was, an, there was enough guys in the game that said, we're not just selling our practice, we're actually selling our profession if we do this. And I think what's happening is big business thinks, oh, we can, let's try again. Let's knock on that door because maybe these, this generation is a little more scared and they won't see that they're selling their profession. They'll actually just think they're making a killing on their practice. So let's get in there. And the young residents are coming out. They have no idea what they can actually make as a practice owner. Their only perspective is, you know, a daily rate at a, you know, a big orthodontic practice. Or what's the daily rate for a resident coming out of school. And that's still good money. And so they get out there and they think, well, I can, I'm going to make a good living, so why do I want all the headache of owning a practice? And they, they just don't know the difference in control and the difference in what they can actually make financially. Or integrity. Or integrity. Because you hear, you hear a lot of people, I mean, you go into dental town, there's a gazillion complaints about, you know, they, if they have periodontal disease, I'm supposed to put in all these perio chips or right. this or, you know, I mean, the, there's non-doctors making clinical pressures yeah yeah and this is finance. this is um it's interesting because i have a i have some good friends in the medical space and in the in the the, the med tech startup space and um in discussions with them what happened in medicine is you know patients used to pay doctors and doctors would provide their service and then if someone had insurance they would you know put a claim and the insurance would put a little something in what happened is insurance realized, hey, we're going to just sell right to the patient and we'll collect the money and then we'll, we'll tell you who you can see. And so the doctor kind of got, got scooted out of it and the doctor's over there saying, well, wait a minute, I see the patient, 
but the insurance company is now dictating what the doctor can do. And so any doctor that really wants to treat the way they feel is best, they're limited. And I don't think people realize in orthodontics that the further you get into that, what we just talked, the sellout game, where you kind of sell your practice and say, I'm just going to work for somebody, th that somebody controls what you do. They may say they're not going to, but the person writing the checks that employs you, if it's not you, they can tell you how to practice. And it, there's no way around that. But here, here's the, the proof of what you're saying. So go back to the uh, More Tonic Centers of America Day when, when they would come in and buy Old Man McGregor's practice. Right. And they say he had to work at least two years. Right. What percent of them quit the day they could legally quit? Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. So now, now we're three decades later. Yeah. These big corporates, they, they buy Old Man McGregor's office and say, you got to work there two years. What percent of them walk in two years and like, oh my God, and run? 100%. Sure. That, that, it's a cash out. That's, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. sure. But, but I'm not seeing it as cash out. I'm seeing people saying, oh my God, I can't believe that. I, 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 on Dental Town, they're saying, I left out of disgust. You, they're saying they, they, they say they left because they didn't agree with how it was being ran. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, so that's that's an integrity issue. Oh, well, for sure. And and I I think people that that even sold the first time kind of realized, oh wait, I have to I have to work for somebody. That that's part of the deal. And they they didn't really want to do that. But mm. I I hear stories of, of residents coming out, and you know they'll come to these courses, or they'll see me or JC talk, or they'll you know come visit my office or whatever and you know they'll be working in these places and they just go man i really wish i could do that i wish i could do that but you know i can't this is you know this is my job i can't really i can't change the whole protocol and i can't you know mix it up and start to treat patients differently because this is the way it works here and i i think yeah, people don't realize how important that is that autonomy of being a healthcare provider, to do all this research, spend all this money, do all this continuing education to improve your approach, and then get back to your office and not implement it the way you want to implement it. That's the beauty of our specialty. That's what makes it so but magical. do you think that we're, um, we were both born in the 60s. Um, um, I was born in 62. Do you, do you think that we're a different beast than the millennials, um, um, that they're not as, driven as we are and just want a job and, and don't <laughs> yeah. care I, I, I love this question because I don't, are... I don't think so. I, I'm not, um, I'm not on that millennial bandwagon that's like, oh, they're all spoiled and they don't, I think they're incredibly driven. And I know a lot of millennials that are really, really passionate and want to do stuff. I think the way they do stuff is different. I think their, their, their patience, their tolerance for pain is a little bit different. Um, their patient scope is a little bit shorter, which means they're kind of looking a little bit more two years than 10 years. And the, the guiding principles, however, I think are very much the same. I think their challenge is they just don't really know how to get there. I think they all want autonomy and they want to control their destiny. Um, but I think their, their need to be there faster is, is what's hard and and they they don't really have the the tools to to see that that scope of 10 years okay if I just if I do this then five years from now I will not have given up that and now I'll have this next level it's there's not enough examples of it and I think that's what's kind of sad in you know healthcare and the profession of orthodontics or dentistry is um, there's a lot of fear and, and to get examples of clinicians that are just, that are really doing it like their way and saying, no, I'm going to learn the best thing for me and I'm going to practice that way and give somebody else permission to do that. There's just, I don't think there's as much of that. There's so much fear and there's so much talk about fear. Oh, this company's coming in and they're going to take all our patients and GPs are doing ortho now. So you're going to be out of a job. And uh, that's not, that's not where we need to be. Fear is not a good thing for the profession, for sure. Um, 
I'm going to uh, throw throw you under a bus now. Now, now I'm going to throw, throw me under, under a bus. bus. I'm ready. Um, a lot of a lot of people that are really successful in in the cosmetic space that do the most tummy tucks, boob jobs, facelifts, they're always good looking people like you. <laughs> you never see short, fat, bald guys. The number one breast implant facelift guy in in the town. It's just true. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Is that true? Yeah, I don't know. It's, okay. absolutely, I don't know. I mean, it's absolutely true. Okay. And everyone knows it. Um, in ortho, the average orthodontist is getting about 30 opportunities and closing 15, banding up 15. Uh, is that a, a fact? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what the, the major league consultants say that have been doing consulting. Okay. 50% for conversion. Like a 50% conversion. Got it. So okay. I'm just curious, as handsome as you are, what is your conversion rate? So our conversion overall, and we do it so we don't count twice, our conversion right now is about 75%. So you're three On purpose. Um, on purpose? What do you mean on well, purpose? Well, I count every exam and then every one start. So every one start to my exams is a conversion. So for example, if I have a two-phase patient, they only get one start. When I see exams, Patients that either I don't want in my practice or aren't really ready to accept their problem or maybe the ortho benefit isn't really there, we, we select some of that 25% that doesn't start because we say this, is, this just isn't where you need to be. And I'm more than happy to, I don't want 100% conversion. So I don't, I don't think there's a number that's like, that's the money number. I think you just have to... You have to treat it like you're interviewing the patient just as much as they're interviewing you. And, and I want to start people that understand what I'm doing. And if they don't, then maybe there's a different practice. Well, what if there's an orthodontist listening to you right now in Salina, Kansas? He's got an hour commute to work. Right. And he thinks his, his main problem is he's just not, he's not closing the cell. He's not selling. Yep. What, what, what advice? Because how many orthodontists have you met? Yeah, it, 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 I mean, I talk about this a lot when I, when I speak. And it, it goes by a lot of the stuff that... Um, if you've ever heard Simon Sinek talk about the why of, of business, that people come to you not for what you do, but for why you do it. I think if you go back and really sit down and you're super honest with yourself, and that's the hard part, if you get really honest with yourself and you understand why you're doing ortho, then you double, triple, quadruple down on that and sell that as your value you're going to convert more. I think a lot of people think the conversion is a sale. Oh, how can I get this person to, to come to my practice? How can I manipulate them into buying me? Maybe I'll cut my fee. Maybe I'll you know, do it faster. Or that's, that's not why people are going to pick you. They're going to pick you because of why you're doing it. Are you doing it because you really believe in awesome, awesome quality care, and you want to connect with that patient and their son or that son and the parent and say, look, I'm really, I'm going to put everything into making this awesome for you. And that's the reason I come to work every day. It's not because, you know, I want to buy another house and I want to make three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, or I want to get, you know, more money this month, or I want to get my, my starts. If you're really connecting with all right, I'm sitting down with this patient that just came in and I really want to tell them why I'm here and what I'm going to do for them. Then, then you're not selling anymore. You're actually, you're, you're motivating and you're inspiring the sale as opposed to manipulating the sale. And that's a big, that's a tough thing to get your head around. But if you're quiet with yourself and you think about what drives you, why, why'd you come into orthodontics? What's the point? If you just want money, there's a lot of ways to make money. This is a hard way to make money, I think. Orthodontics is difficult. But if you really believe in all that training, then you're going to find your why, and then you just sell that. If you pulled 100 orthodontists and orthodon every time this has ever been done, what is the most stressful thing about your career? What keeps you up at night? It's always staff. I disagree. No, let me put it this way. I don't want to, I don't want to disagree just to disagree because I think staff is huge. And I think the biggest problem that people have relating to staff is relating. 
it's, it's just the honesty. You have, to, you have to be real transparent with staff, and you have to be real honest with staff, and you have to realize that staff are people. They don't just work for you. They're actually trying to have a life just as great as you, and so that doesn't keep me up at night. We have a, we have a really nice communication tone in my practice now. I mean, it took a long time to develop that, but we have a tone that um, staff things don't, don't keep me up. Is we're, that because you're, you practice right north of Golden Gate Bridge and if they act up, you, come on, we're going to walk across the bridge. Come <laughs> we're, here. we're going on a little walk. <laughs> and then halfway exactly, across the bridge, yeah, yeah. you just push them we off. Have, we have people. <laughs> we have people that can take care of stuff. Yeah. It's the, the biggest thing that keeps me up at night, honestly, is, is, is patient trouble, treatment trouble. Not necessarily, you know, patients being troublesome. I'm, I, I sleep with every single case in my head. That's just my personality. I'm so micro about my cases that it's, if, if something just didn't quite work how I wanted it to work that day, I'm thinking, oh my God, okay, what, how, do I, how do I get that back on track? Or what's, how, how did that happen? that's the stuff that keeps me up at night way more than, than, than anything else. And it's a resolution of those problems. And I, it's, it's a, it's a responsibility that I've kind of, I've just gotten used to. It's just my personality. I really take those things on. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's my why it's, it's the reason I do it. I'm really, these people that entrust their kids and themselves with me, that's, that's pretty huge. I'm not just going to take their money and not worry about them. I really worry about them. And so that is that's so cool. That's yeah. just really cool. For, so for years, orthodontics was just like Boeing, the airline industry. Every time they came out with a new plane, it had all these bells and whistles, but it still only went 550 miles an hour. Right. And ortho still always took 24 months. Yeah, they had all yeah. these bells and whistles for 30 years, but at the end of the day, it still took two years. And it looks like that's starting to change. It looks like ortho is now breaking the speed of sound. Changing and starting dramatically. Starting to go faster. Yeah, for sure. Is that hype? Is that real? No, it's, it's very real. I think we're just getting better at our game. And I think 3D technology is really allowing us to get better at our game. Computer assisted well, what, what treatment. Was your, what was your average ortho time 10 years ago, and what is it today? We've... We've been pretty efficient, so um, it, our average hasn't changed that much. But if you take all of our cases across the board, and this is something that we measure, um, whether it's a full cusp class two, typically an 18 to 20 month plan for us, or you know a class one crowding, mild, moderate, severe, usually a 14 to 16 month plan, our average case, and it's been pretty stable for the last 10 years, including canine impactions and other things, is about 16 months. So you've been fast. We've been fast for a for while. The, were you the first it's, fastest? <laughs> no, it, well, I, it's, I mean, it's I interesting. Anybody, I don't know anybody I, says they're not fast enough. No, I, and, and, and that's it, probably why you're top dog in this game. A lot of it, Howard, is planning. I, I, that rehearsal space of before you start, knowing exactly where you're going, it helps. So treatment planning is kind of a lost art in ortho, and... Minutia treatment planning is a very lost art, which is, I want to know almost down to the appointment and the tooth movement, where we're going to be in six months. And for me, if I'm not to class one normal overjet overbite at my six, seven month reposition appointment, I'm behind. So does this mean you're OCD or ADD or what? What, 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 what exactly are you then? I'm, I'm a perfectionist. A perfectionist. I, I, just, I just like... I just like good stuff. I mean, I just, it's just because what I, it's what I appreciate in, in other things, whether it's a, you know, a, a landscape or a, anything. I just like, I like neat things. I like when, when things are thought out. Because um, it's the, it's, I mean, intelligence is pretty sexy. That I like when people think about stuff before they just do it, you know, and, and, Think about stuff before you say it, you know, process but, but, but it. But what do you think is more important in, um, in healthcare? IQ or emotional quotient relating to the, the patient? 100% emotional. Yeah. I firmly believe it's emotional. Yeah. Uh, emotional IQ trumps intellectual IQ every time. Yeah. If you are the smartest guy in the room but can't relate or tell your story or convince someone of your story, 
then you, you're going to lose every time. Whereas even if your story is simple, but you're really good at conveying it, you're going to win every time. And so I think if you work on people skills more than intellectual skills, you'll progress faster. Since obviously you're talking to uh, a lot of uh, general dentists right now, um, what, how could general dentists work better with their orthodontists? What, 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 what do you like from, what, what do these general dentists do better in their relationship with you? And what do these other guys do that you just want to walk up and smack them? <laughs> That's, I love that. I, it's again, it's a people skills thing. It's, it's the dentist I love working with think similarly to how I think. And it's patient first, patient first, patient first, every time. And if you're thinking about your patient and not your procedure, then you're, you're gonna come up with a better plan, always. And so that's why I, that, those are the dentists I love to work with. I think that takes a little bit of practice maturity because you have to, you have to learn the skills, you have to learn all the procedures first. Um, and developing your patient rapport and being able to tell a patient, you know, no, I don't think we should do this. I, I think we're better off not treating, you know, leaving money on the table. It takes a certain maturity for a dentist to get there where they can leave money on the table. I love dentists that can leave money on the table and just say, no, this is a better plan for this patient or no treatment is a better plan for this patient. So communication in terms of what their goals are and what my goals are helps a lot particularly in interdisciplinary care. What I value most relative to my practice is if I've been able to convince them of why early intervention for me is important and they trust that enough to send their patient to me for an opinion because I'm looking at different things, I love that. What I'm, the, you know, the people you want to bonk over the head are the ones that, you know, you you try and tell the story and they, they say, yeah, 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 I, well, yeah, I get it, I get it. But they've never listened and they never do any of those things. They just continue to do what they're gonna do. And I, I, I think there's, there's some, you know, the, the, the challenges between GPs and orthos are real. I don't, I don't particularly mind if my GPs do ortho. I don't mind, but just know what you're doing. And if you're gonna do a super simple case or something that you're really qualified at, whether it's complex or simple, if you do it well, great. That gives me another opportunity that I can treat a case, my own case, and spend more time on it. I'm not really worried about somebody doing great work and taking it off my plate. That doesn't bother me at all. It's the, the person that's doing that case just for the cash, just to get that extra revenue that month I have very little tolerance for that. That bums me out. And that's what I see. All super successful people don't think in fear and scarcity. They think in hope, growth, and abundancy. I mean, they yeah. Got, they got um, what, one of the pet peeves for me against my homies, the general dentist, is um, they'll go to these courses. That you, back in the day, it was first it was Witzig, and then it was Brock Rondo that just taught that extractions is just like a mortal sin. Oh, right, right. And you just, and, and I, I'm telling you, there's a lot of, I think it's as high as 20% of general dentists think that there is no indication for four bicuspid extraction of that. 100% of the time that you do it, you're gonna dish the face and you orthodontists don't know what you're doing because I yeah. went to see this Witzig or Br yeah. Brock Rondeau. What would you say to that yeah. general dentist out there? It's probably one in five listening. No indication ever for a four bicuspid extraction. There is indication, there is for a four bicuspid extraction, but you have to know what you're, what you're measuring, what, what gives that indication. And again, 3D technology gives us the ability to look at things like we never could before. I extract very rarely. So but what does that mean, I very rarely? And I have a hundred ortho uh, cases, how many of them so do we, 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 we do, you know, we do about 300 starts a year. I extract four bicuspids probably less than five times a year. Okay, so that's pretty much you don't do it. Very few. And what was it in 1980 for the whole country? Way more, way more. I used to- What, what do you I, think it was in 1980? Oh, you mean for the ortho? For the whole ortho profession. Oh my gosh, cases, it was probably 40%. It was probably 40%. I, I was so saying. So 40% was way too high. 
for sure. You're down to 4%. Yeah, or But if or you less. believe it should be zero, now you're an extremist. Yeah, I don't think it should be zero. And, and your and, mom probably dropped you when you were little <laughs> and never told you. It shouldn't be zero. Because there's it, never no, zero. It's, it's, no, there's, 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 never, there's always an exception. So I'm, I'm never a big fan of somebody that says, this is the way. I, and, and I think that's ridiculous for any clinician, even if they're awesome, to think that they've nailed it to think that they have the solution. I think that's absolute crap. If you think you've solved this and you're the master that does it better than everybody, there's, I will bet you, I'll guarantee you, there's 10 things that you're missing that will be apparent in five years that will make your way not as good anymore. And, and so all this guru stuff, I really hate it. Um, and I don't want people to- That's funny because you're a guru. So no, you, no, you I'm, I'm not. I'm, and you I'm, just said, you hate yourself. I, I do. I, I hate, I hate people following my stuff because they think I am, or they think I've got it. I don't have the answers. I really believe I'm an eternal student. And I think that's what make the people that I learn from a lot are always, are always questioning. I mean, I think, you know, the, the hundred percent non-extraction guys, it's, you know, a lot of people just want to get on their their soapbox and just say, oh, you guys are doing it all wrong. You're extracting and we never extract. And here's the proof why we never extract. And it, it's not that cut and dry. This is a, it's, it's individual. Again, you're not going to scale one person. And there are people in my practice when I go through every internal three-dimensional measurement and I put those teeth in their transverse position on the mandibular body, they can't go any further. And those teeth will not fit, including second molars and premolars. And it's just obvious that for some reason, there's a two size discrepancy, jaw size discrepancy here. Those are the people I extract on, but we can practice now. So you have this 3D virtual patient. You can go through a non-extraction setup and an extraction setup and look at those results with three dimensional data and see where things end up. And if you go through that exercise, and you still tell me there are cases that are, and that every case is a non-extraction, I don't know where you're putting those teeth. Um, let's, um, let's go to another controversy. This is Dentistry Uncensored. We only like to talk about the, um, the uncomfortable conversation. Love them. It's so weird when you see so many, cause so I'm in Phoenix, I'm, I'm right up the street from here. Right. 10% of the houses in Phoenix flip every year. Okay. And they're coming from every state. I mean, it's a, it's a transient society. Right. Okay? Probably, I, I assume San Fran is too. San Fran, I mean, it, it doesn't flip quite as fast, but, but I mean, it, the, you know, the housing market's crazy. Well, the, the, well this insane. is a transient society. Okay. And, and, and the, um, the people who study that say Phoenix is a very transient society. So I get a lot of people that, you know, last year they lived in a different state. And you always see them in the middle of ortho, and this is beautiful ortho. You know, they're halfway through treatment, first molar, first molar. Right. But their second molars are pointing four different ways. Yes. And I mean, the, I, I haven't seen an orthodontist pick up a second molar in, in a transfer case in a decade. <laughs> Where are you looking? In Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> so it's so this, of, is, this shouldn't be controversial. On, honestly, this should, orthodontists should pick up those second molars. But they, Bottom they're line. never. No. I, I haven't seen a picked up second the molar reason, in a decade. The reason is nobody's looking. You're looking nobody's telling them they can't nobody and the what lay person the second molars do you pick up oh all of them i'm wow. absolutely the so you do all where, of them, where we yeah. i've never seen one picked up in a decade yeah but it's second molars to, to us particularly mandibular second molars 100 percent across the board maxillary not as much i let those kind of do their own natural thing it's often better than my bracket mandibular molars 24 seven, unless they're riding perfectly, marginal ridge, right in line with that first molar, they're picked up every time. The reason is the case control is superior. Occlusal plane control, superior. Sagittal correction, superior. It makes your case easier. The, the problem is most people don't, well, the lay public doesn't notice. They don't, you know, they, they don't see that. And so if you, if you, don't do it. It's not like, you know, the, the person with braces is going to say, oh, well, 
My smile looks great, but I really want that one straight. Does it affect the retention when you don't pick up second I, You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd like to think it does because, I mean, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to think there's a, re a reason. What would you say listening to you saying, dude, I'm in Salina, Kansas. I ain't picked up a second molar in 30 years. I've never done it. What would you say to that guy? It's fine. I mean, I, but put it this way. I, I pick them up because I think it matters. And... Um, and I, and I like how my cases hold up. If your cases are holding up and you have no problems, I mean, I'm not going to say you're doing it wrong. I mean, I, I don't think there's one way. I, I just think we should all, I mean, it'd be nice if everybody was trying to do it the best way collectively we know how right now. Um, but it's hard. People have different priorities. Another, another and, controversial question. Um, some people say that, you know, you want to have orthodontics, you want to have a better bite, a better occlusion, chew, masticate your food. Other people say, dude, that is bullshit. We have the most refined carbohydrate diet. You could be edentulous and lose your denture and, yeah. just, and you wouldn't die early. Right. Is orthodontics really just cosmetic or do you really <laughs> think it's healthcare form and function? I 100% believe it's healthcare and it's not all about occlusion. There's, there's a whole person attached to this, and there's a whole functional matrix. There's a whole posterior, front, posterior pharyngeal airspace. There's tongue space. All these things are whole health concepts. The occlusion is one big thing that we've always focused on in orthodontics, getting those cusps into the perfect class one. Um, does that mean a class two is going to lose all their teeth and die early and be unhealthy? I don't believe that either. But if I had a teenager right now and I was sending them off into life, I would want their arches developed transverse first. I would want their occlusion to be class one with canine guidance preferably. And I would like their airway to be as huge as possible. Because what I've witnessed in adults that come into my practice, they are falling apart because of those things that are inadequate. Transverse especially is huge. So for me, if you just expand everybody and never did ortho, I think you'd have a healthier adult society. That's kind of my feeling. But I think it doesn't take that long to get the teeth in the right spot. And, and those patients that I've at least been able to observe over the 20 years of my practice, that we get those things right, they, they come back and they don't seem to have dental problems. And, um, crowns, you know, perio work, all that stuff, they just don't have that. The transverse collapse cases, even with bicuspid extraction cases that were treated relatively nicely, occlusally, but everything's axially inclined, axially, axially inclined to the lingual, periodontally not a happy place for those teeth. Those are the adults that are getting the tooth wear and the crown breakage and the, you know, the abfractions. And, and I, I think it just poor occlusions break down. I think you end up in the dentist chair much more when that happens. Whole nother subject. I only got you for seven more minutes, so I'm going to. All right. Make it um, good. One of the biggest complaints of orthodontists is that they're, they're always talking about treating this disease. Whereas another specialty, anthropologists are saying, way slow down, Spanky. When we go back just 400 years, we don't see any malocclusions going back to 2 million years. Yeah. So why, why, are we, why is everybody shoving all these American kids through a 10,600 orthodontic machine instead of going to the pediatrician saying, for 2 million years, that baby was nursing for a couple of years. And the... First instant that baby has difficulty nursing, mom switches to a bottle and a sippy cup, no right. forces. For two million years, baby would be feeding on a dead carcass that was three right. days old and gnawing yeah. and chewing. Right, right, right. And now you're feeding an applesauce. Yeah. Do, you, do you think orthodontists are addressing how to prevent the whole need for all of this? No. Do you agree? Are the anthropologists correct that this is all a cause of a change in diet 400 years ago? I don't know. But that's what they're saying. But but here, here's the thing. I don't I don't believe that I don't believe anybody that says here's the answer. So that's that's my first response. Is there something to it? I I do believe that. Anecdotally, I think there's something to it. 
what I observe in my malocclusions and what I observe in the patients that come to see me. It's a transverse problem. It's a lack of maxillary sutural development, which we know just intuitively you can, tongue plays a big role in that. Swallowing, nursing, all those things help develop the maxilla. Mastication plays a big role in that. So I do believe there's something to it. And we live in a society with a lot of different stuff going on. There's a lot of things that we create in an industrialized world that we weren't breathing 200,000 years ago, whenever the, the evolutionary um, people say teeth were great. Um, so before that industrialization, yes, I think malocclusions were, were less frequent and the anthropological data will show you that. And I do think there's something environmental to that. What exactly it is, I don't know if we're ever going to know, but I'm a big proponent of, I use this analogy of malocclusions being a car crash. And <laughs> we, can, we can fix a car crash, we can become a body shop and just bring the car crashes in, we'll fix them up, make them straight. And one of my analogies and my, my big pushes for early treatment is I want to be a crash detection system. I want to get there before the crash happens. So we do a lot of phase ones. The more I learn and the more I talk to these, you know, anthropology guys and the myofunctional guys, and the more I just kind of think about what I see, what's happening in orthodontics, I wonder, okay, am I even too, am I not early enough? Like, did that car crash happen at six months or nine months? And how do, how do we learn what the intervention is? So it's a challenging subject because there's a firm line between myofunctional, the myofunctional guys and the orthodontist guys. It's, it's battlefield. And, and that's sad to me because we both have good things we can teach each other. And I would love to see some communication, some open communication, please, not combative communication. Let's, let's find out what we know and see if we can fix the person. Let's not focus on who's right. Let's focus on where's the, what's the best for the patient? What's happening for the patient? Cross that data between ourselves and find a better solution. My goal is I don't want to have to do fixed ortho. I mean, I would love to prevent every malocclusion and I think we're preventing canine impactions like crazy now. I don't see canine impactions in my office if I meet a patient at seven, eight, nine. I just don't see them. Because of phase one? For sure, a hundred percent for sure. And, and I think if we can go back even further and start to cross communicate, learn some more about all right, what's happening from three to five, what's the breathing like in those stages? What was the nursing history? What was the tongue doing at six, seven, eight? How did that get us to here? It's a really hard thing to study, and that's why everybody is kind of on their soapbox screaming, oh, I have this paper, this shows it, and <laughs> you don't have that paper. It doesn't what, what exist. What percent of the orthodontists think that myofunctional people are nuts? 99. <laughs> and what percent of the myofunctional people do you think are nuts? Um, I, I would say there's probably... Um, I, I don't think anybody's nuts. So, oh, I'm so nuts. yeah, I can assure you, but you're nuts in a good way. <laughs> I, I, I would say if, if you're doing what you believe, if, what you believe, you're not nuts. So I don't care if you're, you know, moving teeth with, with stones and, and massage. If you believe that, do it. Um, I believe being dogmatic is unhealthy right. for the growth of yourself and for whatever you're trying to accomplish. So the minute you start hating on the other group, you're, you're slowing everybody down. It's just, it's not worth it. So I don't think anybody's nuts. I, I just think people that become too egocentric and dogmatic about their stance, th then they're, they're missing out. I just wish the, um, like, like the US healthcare system, my number one complaint of the US healthcare system, besides it's too expensive, doesn't cover everybody, is that not even 1% of the $3 trillion is spent on R&D. So when 99% of the money goes to treat it, however we're doing it today with slugs and leeches and cutting stuff off, you know, in, in Intel, it'd be 5% would right. go to R&D. So right. the U.S. health care, you just look at it and say, well, you should spend, four, you know, 
five percent on trying to prevent all this yeah. disease. And I, I think the orthodontists need to um, spend more time wondering why. Well, yeah. Why are all these kids? Be, because the anthropologists, yeah. I mean, I've talked to several of them, and they're like, yeah. "Dude, you just don't see this." Yeah. So it's 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 kind of my it's, it's my major project. Howard, one of the big goals for me is to is to get us more into a little bit more R and D. And so um, I don't know if you're familiar with my project Orthoscience, which is a which is kind of a it's 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 a studying project. It's a drilling down into what orthodontics does and how growth and development happens using this 3D space that we just talked about. And the goal for me is to create a, a place where this digital space actually can connect intellect and evidence in a way that's digestible, that makes sense to you and me and a general dentist and an orthodontist and a patient. And we start to actually study it. All this digital data that we're collecting, insanely valuable for how we grow. And so what I want to do is make these things digestible. So, it's, so there's actually evidence we can all look at and, and learn from and not just stand in our corners and say, I have the answer. It, we can start to get back into a little bit of R&D somehow. And if we all contribute a little bit to that, whether it's knowledge, resources, one case, whatever. And, then what, and what is that, www? www.orthoscience.com. And um, you're going to find nothing there but a very cryptic front page. Orthoscience. Um, orthoscience, one word. Dot com. Dot com. And it says, what is the secret handshake? It's, <laughs> it says, please tell me your secret code. And then, so is this it's, orthodontist only? It's not. And, and it's, it's so, so what we're building is, 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 is much more, uh, much more global, in my opinion. Much more, uh, I, I'm, I'm not... I'm not isolative. I don't, I don't want to say, oh, let's just keep the orthodontist get the secret or the general dentist get the secret. Or I, I really, I'm always thinking about the patient and thinking, all right, what's going to benefit the patient long term? So, um, so we have, like on that site, if you go to it, you're going to see subscribe here, which is just a place where you can say, oh, yeah, I want to, this, I, don't, I don't know what's happening yet, but I want to be involved with this. If you go to the Orthoscience Facebook place you can actually see a little bit you can see some teaser of what we're building what's happening um but it's really it's 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 focused on getting people involved with evidence patient evidence and this 3d space that volumetric scanning and intraoral scanning is bringing us like i said it's a truth that we haven't had in 100 years of the profession and so examining that truth in a smart way is going to exponentially grow our specialty. And I think patients are gonna benefit from it. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're, doing a, we're doing a slow build. So hopefully if you do have 20,000 listeners, 20,000 people don't go there. Cause it's, it, cause they're 20, just- 20,000 would be yeah. the lowest one. No, ever since they, I'm ever since they taught us, um, um, we used to put these up, if you do podcasts, we used to put these up with a link to leave Facebook to go to iTunes or YouTube. Of course, Facebook doesn't like that. You upload the video, right. and then Facebook shoves it out. But I was wondering, was this page designed by a Freemason? Because they have a secret site. It's It's secret, right? It looks very cool, doesn't the it? Remember Freemasons? Oh, so it's, it's it, cool. the coolness factor is <laughs> design is huge. Howard, I'm all about Well, Sean, I think you're, you're cool, so, and I think you're you. elegant. I appreciate and, uh, that. Thank you so much for being my humble pleasure. enough to come onto my little bitty show. <laughs> Because you are, I don't, you are the most, I don't think it's a little most, show. You are the most requested orthodontist, and I, I have been emailing you, you for you. two years. And you know who also worships the ground you walk on? You know no. Anne Marie Gorsuchek. I know her very well. She Absolutely, thinks, she thinks when Hi, she Anne dies Marie. that you'll you'll be Jesus. I okay. mean, she she does. She just she worships you. She's too kind. She is. Thanks, no, Anne Marie. She's adorable. And I yeah. love Anne Marie too. We'll yeah. we'll have a mutual Anne Marie. We'll do a we'll do a, a triple podcast one yeah. day. Okay. And uh, and um, and. Last word, last parting shot is um, those oral myofacial people. I mean, I mean, nobody knows the answer. Nobody, like you said, nobody has the paper because when you ASU, I, where I got my MBA, yeah, they have the oldest hominid fossils in, in the world. They yeah, have yeah, Lucy. yeah. And yeah. when you go talk to those guys, they say, "Hey, all this stuff you're seeing, it's all new. 
Right. So nobody knows. So how could they be nuts and the Orthodox know it all when actually, like he says, no one knows. No one's holding no, the no, paper. No, no, no. He says, because these, um, these millennial mothers, I mean, okay, so, yeah, so yeah, look, yeah, look at I the know. difference in millennial mother. So I was born in 62. In 72, my mother went to a garage sale and bought some encyclopedias that were printed in 52. Right. So my first information was 20 years old. Right. These millennials are on Google and the questions they're asking, um, I mean, you got 27 year old mothers with a first baby and they're asking questions. I'm like, dude, the or nobody knows. I know. You're asking I, me I, questions I know. that nobody I know. even knows. Yeah. So they're, the millennials are onto this because they're also, my first 30 years, I was never asked this question. I'm always asked, um, should I get my uh, baby's um, uh, lingual frenum lasered off? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. Will that make her nurse better? If she nurses right. better, will that form her face yeah. better? And I'm like, shit, girl, they never. Right. I mean, yeah. you're asking me questions and, and, no one talked about for 30 years of dentistry. Exactly. And I think people know what is evidence in their practice. That's what I want. That, that's what I'm excited to share. Because if I, if I do something that nobody else is doing and I'm seeing evidence of it working all the time, like a lingual phrenectomy, right? I mean, you never think of that unless you do it. But if you see really positive results from those every time, that to me is evidence. I don't even need the paper on that. If I talk to somebody I trust and I see their experience clinically, that's evidence. So people know what they know I just don't think people know it all. So if somebody is claiming so I have the I answer, call, if I call my mom right now, will you will you tell her that, that, that she does? I would love I would love I'm to. I'm call my mom right now. Your mom um, does know it all, though. But um, I, I do th I do think this with your patients. I, I this is what I believe, and I say that baby's got a nurse at least six months. And when you give up, and and, and I yeah, think and there's, I mean, and there's months. you know there, there's personal choices that go into that, but I I mean I agree it's it's there's a natural thing that that happens with with swallowing and tongue and and all that that mother Sean, nature's pretty good. Thank you so much for my coming pleasure. on the show. My pleasure, Zach. Thank, thank you, you so much for working on a Saturday. Thanks, Zach. No problem. All right.